Right, ladies and gentlemen, let's continue with chapter 11 on heat exchanges. We've already start with it, started with it. The first part was on the different types of heat exchanges. Then we've looked at the overall heat transfer coefficient and then paragraph 11.3, the analysis of heat exchanges. Okay, we've done that and we've done all the theory. And with the previous lecture, I just started with problem 11.1. Problem 11.1 is a tube in tube heat exchanger, and I'm going to read the problem to you. It is based on problem 11.1 in your textbook, but I've revised it a little bit. So the problem says hot oil is to be cooled in a double tube counterflow heat exchanger. The copper inner tubes have a diameter of 20 millimeters and negligible thickness. The inner diameter of the outer tube, the shell, is 30 millimeters and water flows through the tube at the rate of 0.5 kilograms per second and the oil through the shell at the rate of 0.8 kilograms per second. Now, it doesn't give the inlet and outlet temperatures at this stage. With the next lecture, we're going to start bringing in the temperatures. But it gives the average temperature, it says the average temperature of the water and the oil should be 45 degrees Celsius and 80 degrees Celsius respectively and then determine the overall heat transfer coefficient of this heat exchanger. Okay, takes note, take note, it asks us to determine the overall heat transfer coefficient of the heat exchanger. Okay, uh, with the previous lecture, I think we've finished up to about this point, but somebody brought it to my attention that somewhere, somehow, I said something or write something wrongly, and by this case, I think you know that it actually happens quite a lot, that sometimes between what I mean, what I say and what I write, might be four different things, but in any case. So I think that is the information. The hot oil, here we can see it's going on the outside. Let me see if I can change this thing, adjust it a little bit. Okay, the hot oil in the annulus at 80 degrees Celsius, the cold water in the inner tube at 0.5 kilograms per second. The average temperature of the oil in the heat exchanger is 80 degrees Celsius. And if we go and look at the textbook, we can get the density, the Prandtl number, the K value, and the viscosity for the oil. And then also at a temperature of 40 de 45 degrees Celsius for the water, the values for density, the pronal number, the thermal conductivity, and the kinematic viscosities, those are the values, and I didn't write the units down here because it's exactly the same as those units. Okay. Are you ready for the problem? You've got it? Okay, let's start. You will see that I've divided this page sort of in two, so I would recommend that you do the same. So use two columns. The left column, we're going to do the oil, and in the right column, the water. Now the water is the simplest of the tube too, in the sense that the water flows through the inner tube. So let's start with the water side. The water side, we can say that the mass flow rate I, to indicate is on the inner tube, is equal to the density multiplied by the area multiplied by the velocity. The mass flow rate is given of the water as 0.5, the density of the water is 990.1, and the area through which the water flows would be equal to pi divided by 4 multiplied by 20 millimeters square multiplied by the velocity v. Okay, and that would be the velocity in the inner tube, vi. So from this we can solve the velocity in the inner tube to be equal to 1.61 meters per second. Okay, now, now we can calculate the Reynolds number. The Reynolds number is equal to the velocity multiplied by the diameter divided by the kinematic viscosity. Obviously, you could have also calculated the Reynolds number directly by using the mass flow rate relationship. The velocity is equal to 1.61, the diameter is 20 millimeters, 
divided by the kinematic viscosity, which is equal to 0.602, multiplied by 10 to the minus 6, and that gives us a Reynolds number of 53,490. Okay, so looking at this Reynolds number, we can make the conclusion that the flow must be turbulent. And if the flow is turbulent, it takes 10 diameters before it is fully developed. Okay, 10 diameters. They didn't give us the length of the heat exchanger, but I, I'm not really aware of heat exchangers with a length of 10 diameters or 20 diameters. Usually it's longer. So it is safe to assume that since we do not have the length to say the flow is turbulent, but also fully developed. Now we can go and calculate the heat transfer coefficient and we can get the heat transfer coefficient from one of the relationships which are available in the textbook. And there are quite a few. There are the Dittus and Boulter equation, the Sider and Tate, the Glinsky equation, etc. And it is a little bit di difficult to really to figure out which one is the best and the most accurate. But if you don't want to do too much work, then the simplest one is to use the Dieters and Boulter type of equation. And this equation says the Nusselt number is equal to 0.23 multiplied by the Reynolds number to the power of 0.8 multiplied by the Prandtl number. Take note, the Prandtl number to the 0.4 because you can choose n equal 0.3 or n equal 0.4. 0.4 is when the fluid in the tube is being heated. Okay, so this is for the case where the fluid in the inner tube is being heated. Okay, so that would then be equal to 0.23 multiplied by the Reynolds number, which is equal to 53,490 multiplied by the Prandtl number, which is equal to 3.91 to the power of 0.4 and that gives us a Nusselt number of 240 let me write it here of 240.6 okay are you with me okay once we've calculated, calculated the Nusselt number, we can determine the heat transfer coefficient. The Nusselt number is equal to the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the diameter, divided by the thermal conductivity. Let's just to make things more clear, indicate that these are all the values on the inside. Okay. The values on the inside. The Nusselt number is equal to 240.6 is equal to the heat transfer coefficient on the inside multiplied by the diameter which is 20 moles divided by the thermal conductivity which is equal to 0.637 from which we can determine the heat transfer coefficient as 7663 watts per square meter degrees Celsius or per Kelvin. The heat transfer coefficient is equal to 7,663 watts per square meter degree Celsius. Okay. Let's go and do it now on the annular side, on the oil side. On the oil side, we can also say the mass flow rate in the annulus is now equal to rho A multiplied by the velocity. Okay, the mass flow rate of the oil is equal to what is the mass flow rate of the oil? Oil is equal to 0.8 it's equal to the density of the oil which is equal to the density of the oil which is 
0.8582 multiplied by the area through which it flows. That's right, pi divided by 4. Now it flows through this area here, so it is equal to 30 millimeters square minus 20 millimeters square multiplied by the velocity on the outside. Okay, from which we can solve the velocity through the annulus as equal to 2.39 meters per second. Okay. So if you look at the two velocities, what would you expect the Reynolds number to be, laminar or turbulent? <coughs> the velocity is higher, so would you expect the Reynolds number to be higher? About double? Let's see. The Reynolds number is equal to the velocity multiplied by, take note, now the hydraulic diameter divided by the kinematic viscosity because the flow is now through an annulus and for an annulus we can determine the hydraulic diameter okay. velocity is equal to 2.39 and our, our hydraulic diameter is the difference between the diameter of the annulus and the inner tube which is equal to 30 millimeters minus 20 millimeters divided by the viscosity which is much different than that of water the difference in terms of more than an order of magnitude and the result of that is that the Reynolds number is equal to 630 okay so the Reynolds number is not higher than that of the water, even although the velocity is higher because of the hydraulic diameter and also the viscosity of the oil. Right, so now we know the flow is laminar and again we do not know if it is fully developed or not, but let's assume it is. And now the question is, where do we get the relationship for the Nusselt number? And take note, it is now the Nusselt number in an annulus. Okay. Now it is hidden in your textbook, in the textbook of Sengel and Gujar. And it's hidden in table 11.3. And also the same table is in is in table 8.4 in your textbook where we did internal flow convection, internal flow convection. And in that table you can get the Nusselt number for laminar flow for different diameter ratios. And the diameter ratio that we have here is the internal diameter to the annulus diameter and that is equal to 0.667 if you look at the table, you'll see that you'll have to do interpolation to get the value. But something that is very, very important in the table is that it gives two Nusselt numbers. Okay. So the table gives the Nusselt number on the inside and Nusselt number on the outside. Now if you read it very carefully, you will see that what it means is that if you consider flow through an annulus that the heat transfer coefficient on this area is the Nusselt number on the inner surface, that one there. And this one is the Nusselt number there. Okay. So the one that we are interested in is which one? Okay. So the one that we want in the textbook is this one. That one is on the inside and that is equal to 5.45. So that is according to the textbook. Okay. 
But for our nomenclature, it is the Nusselt number on the outside. That is our nomenclature. Because remember, we are looking at the heat transfer over that surface there. Okay. So now that we've got this Nusselt number, we can say the Nusselt number on the outside is equal to the heat transfer coefficient in the annulus multiplied by the hydraulic diameter divided by the thermal conductivity. The Nusselt number on the outside is equal to 5.45. It's equal to the heat transfer coefficient on the outside multiplied by the hydraulic diameter, which is 30 millimeters minus 20 millimeters, which is 10 millimeters, divided by the thermal conductivity of the oil, which is 0.138. And from this, we can calculate the heat transfer coefficient on the outside is 75. 0.2 watts per square meter degree Celsius. Okay. Are you all happy with that? Okay. So now we've got the two heat transfer coefficients in the annulus and also in the inner tube, HI. We have to calculate the overall heat transfer coefficient. That is what we, that was asked from, from us. Okay. So now you don't have to work in columns anymore. You can break it up. And let's calculate the overall heat transfer coefficient. Now the overall heat transfer coefficient that we've derived was in this format. It says 1 divided by the overall heat transfer coefficient multiplied by a surface area. And what, is it, what do we mean with this? We mean that we have to define the surface area that we are going to work with. That is equal to 1 divided by the overall heat transfer coefficient on the inside multiplied by the area on the inside is equal to 1 divided by the overall heat transfer coefficient on the outside multiplied by the area on the outside. And that, all that is equal to 1 divided by the heat transfer coefficient on the inside multiplied by the area on the inside plus the fouling on the inside multiplied by the area on the inside plus, because it is a tube, the lin of the diameter ratio divided by 2 pi kl plus the resistance on the outside divided by the surface area plus 1 divided by the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the surface area on the outside. Okay, are you happy with that? Right. So let's look at this equation in terms of what has been given. They didn't give us any information on the fouling. Okay. So we are going to say that those two terms are negligible. And what they've also said is that this tube is a, thin tube, a very thin tube. Okay, so this 20 millimeters means that the inner diameter is 20 millimeters and the outer diameter is also about 20 millimeters. Okay, so if that diameters are the same, then the lin of that would be equal to one. Of the lin of that, of the lin of one is equal to zero. Okay, so that is equal to the lin of one, and the lin of one is equal to zero. So that term is also negligible. Normally. In heat exchanges, we would work with copper or stainless steel, and the thermal conductivity would also be high. So this term, in any case, would also normally be a very large term, and the result is that term would be equal to zero. Okay. Now again, 
if these diameters are the same, then it means the inside area is also equal to the outside area. Okay. So if that is the case, then we can say that if we look at this equation, that 1 divided by u is equal to 1 divided by u on the inside is equal to 1 divided by u on the outside is equal to 1 divided by the heat transfer coefficient on the inside plus 1 divided by the heat transfer coefficient on the outside. And take note, that is not always the case. It is just sometimes, sometimes you can make these assumptions and then things can be reduced to this much simpler equation. But to do that, you have to use your judgment. You cannot use it as a general rule always. Okay, so 1 divided by u is then equal to 1 divided by the heat transfer coefficient on the inside, which is equal to 1, 7663 plus 1 divided by the heat transfer coefficient on the outside is 75.2 and that then if we calculate it gives us the overall heat transfer coefficient as equal to 74.5 watts per square meter degree Celsius. Okay. What is the implication? The implication is that the overall heat transfer coefficient is approximately, or well not approximately, very, very close to the lowest heat transfer coefficient. You see that? Okay. So what it means is if this is the tube and we want to look at the heat transfer through it, then if we would sort of model it in terms of our three resistance terms then this term on the inside would be 1 divided by 7 double six three. this is a large value so that resistance would be very small this resistance we've also said is very small it's negligible it's almost equal to zero and this one is equal to 1 divided by 75.2 right. so it means this resistance is an order of magnitude more than that one okay. and our problem is being dominated by what happens on the oil side you agree? Okay. now let's see if we can fix this how can we fix it? How can we fix it? Well, let's put on some fins. Okay, so let's put on some fins. So what we do is, on the oil side, we put on some fins. Okay. Is that going to change the heat transfer coefficient on the inside? No. So the heat transfer coefficient on the inside is going to stay at 7663. Okay, and that diameter is also going to stay at 20 moles. We're not going to change that. But here on the outside, let's go and change two things. The one is, the fins is going to influence the heat transfer coefficient. It's going to increase it. Okay, just because of the fact that they are there, the turbulence, the flow separation before the fins and after the fins. It's going to happen. So we do not know what that heat transfer coefficient is, but let's, just for the argument, increase it to 100, which is not a lot, 100 watts per square meter degree Celsius. <coughs> but what we do is, let's increase the surface area on the outside, which is now the unfint plus the fint area. Let's increase that to 6.283 square meters. Okay. What does it mean in terms of the inside? If we calculate the area on the inside, it would be equal to pi multiplied by the diameter, which is 20, 
And the length, let's take it as one meter. So this is the area per meter. So one meter, and that would then give, a, give us an area of 0 0.06283 square meters. So if we look at the two surface areas, we see we've increased the surface area by a hundred. Okay, you see. Okay, now let's see how that is going to change this problem now. Okay. Again, if we now look at the overall heat transfer coefficient, one divided by UA is equal to one divided by the heat transfer, overall heat transfer coefficient on the inside multiplied by the area on the inside is equal to 1 divided by the overall heat transfer coefficient on the outside multiplied by the area on the outside is now equal to 1 divided by the heat transfer coefficient on the inside multiplied by the area on the inside plus 1 divided by the heat transfer coefficient on the outside multiplied by the area on the outside. Let's just go back to this equation. Remember, now we cannot say the area on the inside is equal to the area on the outside. Okay. So therefore, those two terms stay there. Okay. You agree? Okay. So if we now go and calculate it, then it is equal to 1 divided by 7 double six three multiplied by 0 0.06283 plus 1 divided by the overall heat transfer coefficient which is now equal to 100 multiplied by 6.283 and we can say 1 divided by the overall heat transfer coefficient based on the area on the inside is equal to 0 0.06283 is equal to 1 divided by the overall heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the area on the outside which is equal to 6.283 is equal to if we add that all together if we calculate it is equal to 0 0.003668 okay. So, if we go and calculate the overall heat transfer coefficient on the inside now, it is equal to 4,338 watts per square meter degree Celsius. And the heat transfer coefficient based on the outside surface is equal to 43.38 watts per square meter degree Celsius. And we can see there's a factor of 100 between the two of them. But, if we go and calculate U multiplied by the area, U multiplied by the area, it is equal to 272.5 watts per degree Celsius. And the same for the outside, U multiplied by the area is equal to 272.5 watts per degree Celsius. Okay, what is the moral of the story? The moral of the story is the UA stays constant, not U. Okay, U multiplied by the area is a constant. And together with that, if you buy a heat exchanger or if you specify a heat exchanger, you cannot just say the U value is equal to a thousand. You must say it is the U value based on an area, a specific area. There are exceptions, and that the only exception is if the wall is very, very thin and there are no fins, then the heat transfer coefficient is not a function of the area, and you can say the overall heat transfer coefficient is a certain valid, certain value, and then it would be value valid for the inside area as well as the outside area. Any questions? 
You happy with that? Okay. Another problem, example 11.2. Okay, so I'm put 11.2. I'm going to read the whole problem to you just now, but let's just draw it. Here we've got a hot fluid. The inner tube. It's a tube in tube heat exchanger. And there's a cold fluid. Take note, we are not considering the inlet and outlet temperatures now. We will do that in the next lecture. Okay. And the tube is a stainless steel tube and the K value of the tube is equal to 15.1 watts per meter Kelvin. And we've got the following diameters. That diameter is the diameter on the inside. Let me rather draw it like this. That is DI. inside diameter that is the outside diameter of the inner tube and obviously that tube must also have a thickness okay. but the outer diameter is not important it is just the inner diameter and that diameter we call DA for the diameter of the annulus on the inside Okay, and I will give you the diameters just now. Okay, the problem is a double pipe shelling tube heat exchanger is constructed of a stainless steel with a K value of 15.1, an inner, inner tube of an inner diameter of 15 millimeters. So DI is 15 millimeters. Then um, an outer diameter of 19 millimeters. And an outer shell of the inner tube of 32 millimeters. So the diameter of the annulus is equal to 32 moles. The convection heat transfer coefficient is given to be on the inside 800. So the heat transfer coefficient here on the inside is 800 <coughs> and on the outside is, it is 1200. And then it gives the fouling on the inside. So the fouling on the inside is equal to 0. 0004 square meters per Kelvin per watt and on the outer tube it is 0.001 so there is the fouling on the outside 0.001 and that is those are the units now determine the overall thermal resistance of the heat exchanger per unit length and the overall heat transfer coefficients UI and U0 based on the inner and outer surface areas of the tubes respectively. Okay, while you write down everything, I'm just going to clean the board on the side. Thank <laughs> you. 
Okay. The overall resistance is equal to 1 divided by the overall heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the surface area. It's equal to 1 divided by the overall heat transfer coefficient on the inside multiplied by the area on the inside. It's equal to 1 divided by the overall heat transfer coefficient on the outside multiplied by the area on the outside. <coughs> And that is equal to 1 divided by the heat transfer coefficient on the inside multiplied by the area on the inside plus the fouling on the inside multiplied by the area on the inside plus the lin of the diameter ratio divided by 2 pi kL that is the thermal resistance of the wall plus the thermal resistance of the fouling divided by the area on which the fouling occurs plus 1 divided by the overall heat transfer coefficient on the outside ach, the heat transfer coefficient on the outside multiplied by the area on the outside ok, now because we're going to use the areas a lot let's just calculate it the area pi multiplied by the diameter multiplied by the length and we're going to do the calculations per unit length so it is equal to pi multiplied by the diameter it's 15 millimeters multiplied by 1 and that is equal to 0 0.0471 square meters The outside area is equal to pi multiplied by the diameter multiplied by the length is equal to pi multiplied by the diameter is now equal to 19 millimeters because it is the outside area of the inner tube and that is equal to 0 0.0597 square meters Okay, so if we go and calculate the resistance now of all the terms, then the first resistance term is this one. Okay. It is 1 divided by the heat transfer coefficient on the inside, and they were very nice, they've given us all the heat transfer coefficients, normally we will not have them. It's 800 multiplied by the area, which is equal to 0 0.0471. That is that term there, 1 divided by the heat transfer coefficient multiplied by the surface area. Okay. Then the fouling term, that one there. The fouling is equal to 0 0.004 divided by the surface area on the inside, which is still 0 0.0471. Okay plus the lin of the diameter ratio and the diameters are 19 millimeters divided by 15 millimeters divided by 2 pi multiplied by k which is now the thermal conductivity of the stainless steel okay. So this K there is the K of the stainless steel. Take note, KSS, stainless steel. So it is that resistance term there, 2 pi, 15.1.
And the length that we work on is equal to one meter. Okay. The next term is that resistance term there. It's equal to the fouling, which is 0 0.0001, divided by 0 0.0. 597. So that resistance term of the fouling, plus then lastly the resistance of the flow in the annulus, which is 1, divided by the heat transfer coefficient in the annulus, which is equal to 1200, divided by the surface area is equal to 0 0.0597. And those are our five terms. Okay, now ladies and gentlemen, in this day and age where we work with computers, it is very easy to just go and calculate everything. But this is where you have to use your engineering judgment all the time when you look at these resistance terms. And I cannot emphasize that enough. Okay. So what we're going to do is, let's write down all the values here. Okay, and the values are, for the first term, is equal to 0.02, 654 plus the second term is 0 0.00849 the third term is equal to 0 0.0025 plus the fourth term 0 0.00168 plus the last term which is equal to 0 0.01396 Okay, and the total is equal to 0 0.0532, and that is per degree Celsius what? Okay. Okay, now what do we see when we look at these terms? What do we see when we look at the terms? Well, what is important to see is that that is 49% of the total resistance. So if we take 0 0.02654 divided by 0.5533, we can say this term is about half of the total resistance. You see it? Okay. Plus, the second term is the fouling, which is 16%, okay, which is a concern. Okay. The third the resistance would be the resistance through the wall. Okay. The tube thickness is five, uh, uh, 4 millimeters, and it's stainless steel. Its resistance is 5%, so it's not that significant. It's there, but it's not that significant. The fourth term is the fouling on the outside. Okay, and the last term is equal to 26%. Okay, right. So as you as an engineer now look at this problem, and you would like to improve the heat transfer, where should you concentrate on? You should concentrate on this term, because that is where the most of the resistance is, that is the bottleneck for our heat transfer. Okay, you see that? Okay. Okay, so let's calculate the overall heat transfer coefficients. One divided by the overall heat transfer coefficient on the inside multiplied by the area on the inside is equal to one divided by the overall heat transfer on the outside multiplied by the area on the outside is equal to the total resistance. Okay, so one divided by the overall heat transfer coefficient on the inside multiplied by the area on the inside is equal to 0 0.0471 plus one divided by the overall heat transfer coefficient on the outside multiplied by the area on the outside is equal to 0 0.0597 is equal to the resistance of 0.0597. 
0.0532, 1 divided by the overall heat transfer coefficient of area on the inside plus 1 divided by the overall heat transfer coefficient on the outside. The outside surface area is equal to this total resistance, 0.0532. So from this we can solve the overall heat transfer coefficient on the inside is equal to 399 watts per meter degree Celsius. The heat transfer coefficient based on the outside surface is equal to 315 watts per meter degree Celsius. Um, I think this must be square meters here. Watts per square meter degree Celsius, sorry. Okay, and again, let's go and calculate the UA value. <coughs> the UA value, which would be equal to 18.79 watts per degree Celsius. <coughs> and the UA value on the outside, also 18.79 watts per degree Celsius. Okay, so again we can see that the overall heat transfer coefficient, it is very important to specify it on what surface it is. Okay, you cannot just say the overall heat transfer coefficient is a certain value. You have to define the area and therefore it is safer to always give the UA value. So when you want to buy a heat exchanger or want to, when you want to sell a heat exchanger, normally this is the value that you're going to give to your client, the UA value. Okay, does it make sense? Okay, thank you ladies and gentlemen.